was alone. Helpless. Hopeless. I had no family. I didn't belong to anyone. To anyone. To anyone. I was an orphan. No one saw me. No one knew me. I was invisible. I was lost. I was lost. No one claimed me. No one said, he's mine. She's mine. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was hungry. Like all the food in the world couldn't fill me. I was vulnerable. Unprotected, at risk, cold, tired. Tired. I'm tired. I thought I didn't matter. I thought no one cared. No one cared. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. Well, uh, let me take a moment to welcome all of our campuses, as well as those of you who are joining us online. We're very, very excited that you're with us today. And today, we're going to continue in a series that we've been in over the past couple of weeks entitled, uh, How to Neighbor. And today, I'm going to be talking about orphans. Now, as I start this message, I just want to tell you, and I'm going to be very honest with you right up front, that many of you are probably going to find yourselves at a place today that the Holy Spirit of God really begins to deal with your heart and to speak to you about how you can be a part of the solution to this problem. Because I really, really believe this week as I was preparing and as I've been praying over the past few weeks that we're going to learn something today that may be eye-opening to each and every one of us. In fact, um, let me just begin by saying this. I grew up in a wonderful, wonderful family. I had three sisters and uh, there were four of us as kids, and my mom and dad. My dad grew up with eight sisters, if you can imagine that. He was the only boy, and uh, was a wonderful, wonderful family. My mother grew up with three brothers, and so we all uh, were used to having lots of children in our home. We have a very big family, and we get together. We have a wonderful, wonderful time together as a family. And I can honestly say that um, when Angela and I got married, I wanted six kids. Now, when we had uh, the two kids that we have, Angela said, that's enough. Um, and so we didn't have any more children. But I love kids. I love children. And I have always tried to use my position as a pastor and the platform that God has given me to be a, a voice and an advocate of those that oftentimes don't have a voice and sometimes aren't able to be cared for and loved in a way that I really believe that God wants us to love and care for those that are around us. We've been looking at four of the biggest issues that we are facing around the world. And we talked about loneliness. We've talked about poverty. We looked at racial reconciliation last week. And today we're going to talk about orphans. And the one thought that I want us to focus on together for the next few moments as I speak and as I challenge you is that I really want us to focus on this one idea that I want to drive home today. And it's just simply this. It's our bottom line. We are God's plan A to care for people without families. We are God's plan A to care for people that do not have families. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, isn't there a plan B? And let me just tell you this, not when it comes to the church and not when it comes to those of us who are followers of Jesus. God very specifically had a plan. And his plan was the church of Jesus Christ. And that includes every single one of us who proclaim the name of Jesus, who say that we are followers of Christ, who say that we are disciples. We are God's plan A to care for people without families. In fact, let me just show you in scripture what it says. In James chapter 1 verse 27, it says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So James says, if you really want to know what being a disciple of Jesus Christ really is, if you really want to know what it means to be a follower of Christ, if you really want to know what it means to be a Christian, if you really want people to understand who you are as an individual, as you follow Christ, and as you are a disciple, he says, pure and genuine religion. Pure religion. Think about that just for a second. At its purest form, that which is genuine, he says, 
is the kind of religion in the sight of God the Father that, me, that, what? that means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world to corrupt you. And so he says it's caring for orphans and widows. And so today I want to talk about orphans. I want us to specifically look at those kids that are around us in the world who do not have a family. Now, it's sad. I want you to think about it just for a second. Every woman who gets pregnant uh, or who gives birth is not equipped to be a good mom. Now, you may challenge me on that. You may say, Pastor Marty, how could you say that? Well, I want you to think about it just for a second. There are women that have addictions. There are women who have children that they are victims of abuse or they've suffered from mental illness. And they really and truly are not in the position to be able to be to be the kind of a, a mother that God has uniquely designed them to be. And oftentimes, they will be willing or they are willing to say, hey, I'm not going to be able to take care of this child. Somebody else needs to take care of this child. And guys, let me just say this. Just because you think you were man enough to get a girl pregnant doesn't mean that you're ready to be a dad either. And there are so many people in our world today that have been affected by the consequences of not having a family. In fact, in the United States of America, the country that we live in, in the United States of America, there are 400 children across America without families today. But listen to this, in the state that we live in, and the state that we live in, for those of you that are online and for those of you that are watching in other countries, is the state of Florida. In the state of Florida, there are 22,004 kids in foster care. 22,004 kids in foster care. In fact, there are so many kids in foster care right here in Bay County that often we are having to place them into other counties because we do not have enough families or people coming forward to say, hey, we want to be a part of the solution to the problem of orphans in our community. And so let's go back and look. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And so he says, don't let the world push you into its mold. Don't let the world corrupt you into thinking its ways. And isn't it true that in our world today that so many of us, myself included, I am speaking to myself this morning, so many of us, if we were really honest, we have become so corrupted by the world that we are so selfish that when we look out and we look around, we don't even think about those oftentimes that don't have families. And if we do, we often don't believe that we can be a part of the solution to the problem. And no matter how big the numbers are, let me just tell you this. There are more Christians than there are orphans. There are more churches in the United States of America. There are more churches in Florida. There are more churches in our community than there are children in the foster care system. And we could eliminate it immediately if all of us as followers of Jesus began to really believe that we are a part of the solution. So let's go back to the bottom line. We are God's plan A. God has called each and every one of us to love and to care for the children that, that, that are fatherless, to love and to care for the children that are motherless, to, to, to say to God, God, we want to care for the orphans that are in our community. And so as a follower of Jesus, God calls us to do this. In fact, it's a major theme throughout the Gospels. Oftentimes when you hear Jesus teaching, Jesus was talking about kids. And he was talking about the importance of caring for the orphans. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second because oftentimes we don't want to think about those individuals. But let me just say this to you. If I was to say to you today that there was a three-month-old, her name was Sylvia, and her mom was a rehab addict with Oxycontin, and she had no father in her life. Immediately, as you begin to hear the story, as you begin to think about the name, there's something that happens on the inside of you, because Sylvia does not have a mom or a dad. There's a six-year-old set of twins. Their names are Mike and Jacob. Their father is in prison, and their mother overdosed and died. And they find themselves without a mom or a dad. And immediately, you begin to think in your mind, you've heard a name, you've heard a story, you begin to be find in your heart, all of a sudden, you begin to say, hey, you know what? There's a little boy, and there's a little girl. There's, there's a set of twins. And they don't have a mom, or they don't have a dad. And let me just say this to you. They're not a number or a stat. They're a name. They're a face, they're a story, and they're an individual. And we are God's plan A to be a part of the solution 
to the problem. Today, I'm going to share a lot of stories with you from North Star. Because I just want to tell you, I have been amazed as Angela and I were working together to prepare this message. Angela interviewed a lot of people in our church who are either foster parents or parents who have adopted kids out of the foster system. And it was amazing to us, a lot of heroes across all of our campuses. And so today, I'm going to share some stories with you from some different families that attend right here at North Star, who God has used to make a difference in the world that is around us and in the lives of orphans. The first story I want to tell you is about a young lady by the name of Jerrica. And Jerrica is a regular attender over at our East Bay campus. And, and I want to just read Jerrica's story to you. In fact, I was going to try to tell it, but I realized, you know what? I, I really want to be able to share with you the story that Angela and I were able to capture Jerrica attends our East Bay campus, and she knows what it's like to be in the foster care system. She was born to parents who weren't able to care for her, so she and her brother were cared for by extended family members until about the time that she was in middle school. Around that time, she went into into the foster care system, and there she remained until she was emancipated at the age of 17. Unfortunately, fostering teenagers isn't a very popular thing to do. In fact, uh, I didn't even know this, but oftentimes they're the ones that never get adopted. The homes for placement are very limited, and the one constant that foster care children do have is what we call a guardian ad litem. And you know here at North Star, we talk about that all the time, and we have many folks that are guardian ad litems. This is an adult volunteer that is assigned to each child as an advocate, and they are a constant in the child's life, regardless of how many different homes the child may end up in. In Jessica's case, her guardian ad litem actually stepped down from the position and he and his wife went through the process to provide foster care for, Jer- uh, for Jerrica. She lived with them from the age of 15 to 17. And Jerrica said they really took her in as their own. And they gave her all of the love and the privileges that they gave their own children. They wanted to adopt her when she was 17 years old. But Jerrica declined because she was emancipated and, I mean, as an adult at that time. I'm happy to tell you that Jessica is happily married today. And she is raising three beautiful children of her own. And with God's help... She has been able to forgive her parents and is living a healthy and wonderful life. Now guys, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, how one family was willing to step in and to be a part of the solution to the problem. You see, today I'm going to challenge some of you to be a guardian ad litem, to be an advocate for kids that don't have a voice, to be a part of the solution to the problem of orphans in our community. Though about the biggest problems we face in the world today, I I was thinking about them and listing them out this week. And I I just said to myself, what are some of the biggest problems we're facing in the world? And we've been talking about some of those. But as I listed them out, I thought to myself, who are the individuals that suffer the most with these problems? And I want you just to, to think about it for a second. Broken families, fatherlessness, divorce, poverty, substance abuse, incarceration, homelessness, Domestic abuse, gang violence, racism, teenage pregnancy, and human trafficking. Let me just ask you a question, and I want you to answer it. Who pays the highest price for these problems? Children, that's right. Absolutely. It is children that pays the highest price. And it is children that are often neglected, and it is children that oftentimes find themselves in situations that they did not create, and in situations that they have no say-so over. In fact, listen to this. The Bible says in Psalms, it says in Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4, defend the weak and the fatherless. That's a command. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And the Bible tells us, it says, we are God's plan A. We are part of the solution to the problem, and we are the ones that are to do what? We are the ones that are to defend those who can't defend themselves. We're the ones that God calls to say, hey, I want you to be a part of the solution to the problem that so many kids find themselves in, and there's no answer for them. And maybe you're sitting there today, let me just say this, and you're thinking to yourself, but Pastor Marty, you don't understand our circumstances. You don't know our situation. We could never be a part of the solution to the problem. And let me just say this. Before you say no to God, would you be willing to just say, God, I'm going to pray about it. God, I'm going to pray about it. 
And maybe God would begin to work in your heart. And maybe, yes, maybe you can't foster and maybe you can't adopt. But there are other things we're going to talk about today that you could do. And you could be a part of the solution to the problem that we're facing in our community and in the world today. So many orphans without families. I want to tell you about another family. It's the Morris family. They attend our beach campus. And I want to just show you a... Oh, here they are. They attend our beach campus. And let me tell you a little bit about this, their story. Deanna and David Morris lived in another state working with a nonprofit agency that worked against human trafficking in the United States of America. And they learned that through the process that the majority of people, now listen to this. I didn't even know this. I want you to listen. The majority of people who are victims of human trafficking are actually children who are in the foster care system. Now guys, I didn't even know that. Look, just listen for a second. This is not because foster parents aren't participating in the trafficking, but because children who are in the system are very vulnerable and often taken advantage of by criminals in the community, and the foster parents often are not aware of anything that is going on. They decided to get involved in the foster care, hoping to make a difference in the life of an, of an at-risk child. They have two biological children on their, of, of their own, but have always been open to adopting, even from their early years of marriage. They were placed with two small children who had two other siblings that were older and also in the system, but in other homes. As time passed, David and Deanna felt God leading them to also bring the older two siblings into their home to keep the family unit together. Before long, the biological mother had another child, and he was placed with the Morrises when, the, uh, when he was one, years, one year old. About three years after being placed in the Morris home, the five children were adopted by David and Deanna, and they are now a family of nine. Can you imagine that? David and Deanna said that although fostering or adoption may not be right for you and your family, but everyone can do something, they said. Pastor Marty, everybody can do something. Perhaps God is stirring your heart. Perhaps God is saying to you that you can be a part of the solution to the problem that so many kids are facing in the world today. Maybe God is going to speak to you this morning about being an advocate or maybe making a decision to do something where you can be a part of the solution to the problem. Because guys, let's remember the bottom line. We are plan A. There is no other plan. God didn't say, hey, let the foster care system do it. God didn't say, let the government do it. God said, my plan, plan A, is for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and to take care of those that do not have families, those that are orphans and those that are widows. I don't know how many of you remember the commercial. I was thinking about it this week. There's a commercial that comes on TV, and uh, it's a Sarah, a Sarah McLaughlin song, uh, In the Arms of an Angel, and they show all these pictures of these uh, little sad puppy dogs and cats. Y'all you know, ever seen that commercial? Anybody ever seen it? And every time it plays, I'm going to be honest with you, in the arms of an angel, man, my heart strings are pulled. And I'm thinking, man, those poor little dogs, I mean, they need a home. And I bet some of you have probably even went out and you've taken a dog into your house because of the commercial. Let's just be honest for a second. Some of you have said, you know what, I'm going to go get a dog and I'm going to bring him home because that commercial just moved my heart to the place that those poor little puppies, those poor little puppies... And you know, my wife made a great point this week as we were talking. She said, you know, Marty, we brought a dog into our house, and he's been with us for 10 years now. And probably going to be with us two or three more years. And you know what? We have to take care of him just like we would a child. And we have to provide for him just like we would a kid. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to walk out of here today and go, Pastor Marty is against adopting animals. No, that's not what I'm saying. But if our heartstrings are moved for animals, guys, listen to me. We should be bigger advocates of kids than we would ever be of animals. To say there are children in our community that don't have a home, that don't have a family. There's no one to be a voice for them. There's no one to care for them. And God says, I care about them children more than you could ever imagine. In fact, there in your notes, look with me at Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. It says, Father the fatherless, defend, defender of the widows. And, and God tells us that we are to be the ones that does what? He says, God places the lonely in families, and he sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. And I want you to underline the phrase in your notes that says this. It says, God places the lonely in families. God is the one that places children. 
God is the one that says, here is a family that is willing to love this child, and I'm going to place this child into the care of this family so that this family can take care of this kid. And listen to me just for a second, because I think this is important. The only way that God can place a child is for there to be hearts that are open, that are open to say, you know what, God? I could be a foster parent. I could be a guardian ad litem. I could, I could maybe even adopt one of these kids and bring them into my family and treat them just like my kids because, God, you place the lonely in families, and that is why God's plan is the church. It's those of us who are followers of Jesus. And, guys, I'm telling you, think about it just for a moment. If every church in our state and if every church in the United States of America just had one family to step up and to say, I'm going to make a difference, we could do away with those that are orphans in our world today. Every single one of them would have an advocate, and every single one of them would have a family that would care for them. There's a family that attends our beach, our, our, I'm sorry, our Panama City campus, and um, they're a wonderful family. Their names um, are the Nixons, and I want you to listen to the Nixon story. It says, uh, this, this sweet family found themselves face-to-face with the dilemma of knowing that there were children in need and not enough foster homes. After hearing a story about a particular set of siblings, Crystal went to bed and cried all night one night. Her husband, Mike, upon hearing the sniffles, asked Crystal what was wrong, and she told Mike, she said, I just can't sleep, Uh, I can't get these children out of my mind, and was worried about what was going to happen to them. She just couldn't shake the thought, and so, um, of there being children out there with no safe place to live, to eat, or to sleep. Crystal and Mike agreed to begin the process of becoming a licensed foster care family. They They did have some concerns because they have a biological son. And and how would that affect their biological son, they begin to ask. What what are the problems and what are going to be the uh, difficulties? What's going to happen to the other children that we bring into our home? And so would would their child lose on the things that he needed because Mike and Crystal were going to give so much attention to these other children? After receiving wise counsel, they decided to continue the licensing process, and so their fostering adventure began. So far, they have fostered six different children and have been able to adopt two of them. Both Mike and Crystal agree that this experience has strengthened their faith and their marriage. Isn't it interesting? I don't know about you, but I would think, you know what? It seems like it would put strain on a marriage, right? And they say, no, it actually strengthened our faith and it strengthened our marriage. Knowing that they are making a difference in the lives of children who need love, stability, and hope has been worth it all. And they also shared that they are having these little ones in their lives has been the greatest blessing they have ever experienced. They said that if they can make a difference in even one child's life, all of the chaos and the emotional highs and lows are worth it. It isn't always easy, but it is always worth it. Listen to this. Not only are they investing in the next generation, but the opportunity to foster has also opened doors to invest in some of the birth families' lives as well. Do you get it? They're not just making an impact in the lives of the kids but in the lives of the parents and those who have birthed these kids. And so maybe you're sitting there today saying, Pastor Marty, but I'm not called to adopt. I I, I don't think that I could do that. But here's the thing we can all do. We can all pray. We can all say to God, you know what, God? If you want us to be a part, then Lord, we'll be a part. In fact, let me just say this. I want you to think about it just for a moment. Maybe there's a teenager that's struggling to graduate. There's two siblings that, 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 are, that are beginning to say, uh, that are wanting to stay together, but they can't stay together. Maybe there's a child with special needs who will never thrive, but they just need some special, tender, tender loving care. And maybe God has decided that you are the answer. You are the answer to the problem. And the question is, would you be open to say to God, God, I realize that maybe this is the calling that you placed on my life, and maybe I could be a part of being an advocate for some of these kids to help in their, in their distress and in their situation. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe you could say, God, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. Because I want to be able to, to adopt, and I want to be able to bring a kid into our family just like, God, you brought me into your family. In fact, look there in your notes with me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. I want you to listen to what it says. 
God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You see, maybe, maybe you're here today at one of our campuses and you don't understand this. Every single one of us are orphans. Every single one of us, in the eyes of God, were separated from his family. And we were orphaned. But God, out of his incredible love for us, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. To shed his blood, to pay the price for our sins. So that each and every one of us could be adopted into the family of God. And isn't it true today that we are adopted sons and daughters of God? And in the same way that God has adopted us, God is calling us to be a part of the solution to the problem of orphans in our community and those that are around us. Maybe you're saying, Pastor Marty, I'm going to say it again, I could never foster. I mean, it would break my heart. Let me just tell you what some of these folks have said. If it doesn't break your heart, you're probably not doing it right. It is heartbreaking. It is difficult, but it's a calling. And God's plan A was the church. God's plan A was you and me. And he reminds us in Ephesians, he says, just as I have adopted you, I want you to be a part of adopting these kids and be a part of making a difference in the lives of each and every one of these children. You see, when did serving God become about our convenience and our comfort? I mean, I was asking myself that this week. I was like, you know what, Angela, isn't it true that in, in, in our culture today, it's become more about our comfort. It's become more about convenience. We say, you know what, if, if church is not convenient, I'm not going to go. If I'm not comfortable or if Pastor Marty makes me uncomfortable or if they say something that makes me uncomfortable, then I'm just not going to go back. I'm not going to be a part. But God, God says to us, listen, sometimes we have to get out outside of our comfort zone. Sometimes we have to inconvenience ourselves so we can say, I'm going to be a part of the solution to the problem. And I know what you're thinking in your mind. You're thinking to yourself, hey, I've got to protect my heart from breaking. I don't want a broken heart because I know that if I bring some of those kids into my home and then they get adopted, it's going to be difficult for me. But let me just say this, because here's what many of the families said said to us. They said, you know what? We know that spiritually we are making a difference in their life. Because you know what happens every single Sunday across all of our campuses? These families that are a part of the foster care system, and some of them that have even adopted, they bring their kids every single Sunday to church. And it's making a difference in the life of those kids. And no matter where they go in life, and no matter what happens, their life spiritually is going to be different because of the impact that these families are making in those kids' lives. I want to tell you one more story before we close. There's a family, their names are the Holtons, and they attend here at the Panama City campus. And they were telling us their story. Uh, Josh and, and Kelsey Holton know what it is like to have their hearts broken. After a failed pregnancy, the couple prayed about whether their, uh, what their next step should be. They both agreed that God was calling them to foster orphans in the community. Their first foster child was a precious little one that they had in their home for two years. After two years of nurturing and loving this little child, he was returned to his birth family. It was hard on Josh and Kelsey, but it was also very hard on the entire family. The aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, all were heartbroken because of what had happened. But that does not mean that the child wasn't worth it. Not according to Josh and Kelsey. The same day their first little guy was returned to his family, two more children were placed in their home. Kelsey says that if they can provide stability and love and a normal childhood, uh, I'm I'm sorry, and normal childhood for hurting, broken children, then it is all worth it. Josh and Kelsey make it a point to pray over their children every evening. They teach the children Bible verses. They make sure that they have all, they all have an age appropriate Bible that they can take with them uh, as they are, 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 I'm sorry, uh, when they return to their family. The impact they are making goes well beyond anything that we can see with our eyes here on earth. It is always, it isn't always easy, but it is always worth it. We are God's plan A. God has called each and every one of us to be involved. And let me make two promises to you. First of all, it won't be easy, guys. And God may move in some of your hearts today to become a foster family. God may be speaking to some of you about maybe adopting. And I'm going to tell you this, it won't be easy, but let me say this, it's worth it. 
It's worth it for the child. It's worth it for the difference that you make. And everyone can adopt and everyone can't foster, but everyone can and should do something. In fact, I want you to look in your bulletin, and we've listed out there some things that you can do because I believe God wants all of us to be a part. He wants every single one of us to get engaged. The first thing that we can do is pray for children who are without families. And you see, that doesn't really cost you anything but a little bit of time. Every one of us can pray. Secondly, you can speak up for them every chance you get. Maybe some of you today, God's calling you to be a guardian ad litem, that you become a voice. You become a voice for those that don't have a voice. Third, you can, pr- uh, you can provide for them by donating clothing and supplies to local agencies. Because often when kids are dropped off in a home, did you know that they only have a diaper and sometimes they only have the shirt that is on their back? And the families need the support. You can offer support to foster parents. You can bring meals. You can provide for them a date night. You can go grocery shopping for them. They need people to step in and be an advocate and to help. You can protect them from harm. That is, you can become a voice for those that sometimes are placed in harm's way. You can visit them where they are. You can become a mentor or a tutor. You can help those kids. And seven, you can encourage them to press on because sometimes they just need a voice of encouragement in their life because they're discouraged. Or number eight, you can adopt them into your family. Even children who have aged out of the system still need healthy family support systems. And guys, let me tell you, there's a lot of teenagers. They don't have that. And they just need a family that would be willing to say, you know what? I believe that we are part of God's plan A. And we want to make a difference. So let me close with this thought. There's a little boy and there's a little girl. And tonight, they're going to get on their knees to say their prayers. And their prayer is probably going to go something like this. Dear God, if you're real, would you provide a family for me? Because I am lonely and I am hurting. And that little child is crying out to God to say, God, if there is a family out there that I could be a part of, where I could feel loved, where I could feel cared for, where I could feel like I could be a part of a family unit. God, please place me in that home. You could be a part of the answer to that child's prayer. And today I want each of us to pray and ask God, what is our part? How can we help? Because I want our church to be a voice for the voiceless. To be an advocate for those that don't have advocates. Because guys, there are so many kids in our community. There are so many kids in the United States of America. There are so many kids in our state that need families. God's plan A was not the government. His plan A was the church. Because he knew that as Christians, we could point them towards his heart. And their eternity could be changed forever. Let's pray together. Father God, there are some amazing, amazing families here at North Star across all of our campuses. And today, I want to thank you for these these wonderful families that allowed us to share their stories. And God, I believe with all of my heart that as I pray for these families today, I want to say that, Lord, they and the way that they live and what they're doing Uh, probably represent you in a greater way than any of us could ever understand or imagine. Because we all are orphans. And God, you adopted us into your own family. And today, I want to pray for our church. Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us. And the only step that I want to offer today is, God, for each and every one of us to just simply ask you, what is it that you would have us to do? For some of us, maybe it's to become a guardian ad litem. For others of us, maybe it's to look at these eight things that we've talked about, these steps that that we could take to, to in some way be a part of making a difference in the life of orphans. And God, I pray that you would help us to get up and to go out and to make a difference, not to walk out today and to go, you know, that was a great message, or, you know, Pastor Marty made me feel a little bit guilty, or, you know, may, maybe I don't really need to worry about this. God, we are plan A. There is no other plan. 
And the thing that you want from each and every one of us is you want open hearts to just say, I really believe that I can be a neighbor. And the way that I can be a neighbor is I can pick something and say, I'm going to do this because I know that I can make a difference. And so maybe it's to come alongside and to help those who are fostering. Or maybe it's to open our home to uh, pray about and, and to begin to think about entering the foster care system so that we could foster kids that does, don't have a family. And we could bring them to church and help them to experience love just like, God, you have given us your love. And so today, I pray very specifically, Lord, that you would help us to make a difference. Because, God, you have called each and every one of us to be plan A. To be a part of making a difference in the world that's around us. For the orphans that we so many times see, but so often we don't think about. So, Father, help us to take the next step. As we follow you with all of our hearts. For we pray and we ask this in the name that is above every other name. And all of God's people together said, amen and amen. Hey, I want to say a couple of things today. You know, I, I hope more than anything else, this message is not making you feel guilty. That was not what I wanted to do. I hope it inspires you. And it inspires you to make a difference. Because I believe that God wants each and every one of us as followers of Jesus to make a difference and to be a part. And so would you and your family go home and pray about it and just say to God, God, we want to be a neighbor, the kind of neighbor that makes a difference and the kind of neighbor that helps those that don't have a voice because there are so many that are around us without a voice. And I really believe that if we'll do that, God will show us very specifically what we need to do. In just a few moments, we're going to receive the offering. As we do, let me say this. Each and every week when you give here at North Star, you are helping those not only uh, that, that are orphans and those that are in the foster care system because we as a church support that, and we are always looking for ways to be a part. And so as you give today, if you want to be a part, you can give, and you can know that we're going to continue to support and help those who are not only in the foster care system but the orphans that are in our community because we deeply care about each and every one of them. For those of you that are watching online, if you want to give, you can look right up there uh, to the right and you'll see the give button. You can click on that and you can be a part as we receive the offering today. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn your attention towards the screens and to listen to North Star News and they'll instruct you when to pass the buckets. Thank you, Pastor Marty. Now in just a moment, we'll begin the offering. But before then, I'd like to remind everyone of a really cool opportunity coming up this month. On November 19th, our church is having another serve day. This is our opportunity to come together as the body of Christ to serve people in our community in a very unique way. If you would like to be a part, simply speak with your small group leader or see Guest Central for more information. As we begin the offering, you'll find your buckets at the end of your row. You can go ahead and pass them now. Now, if you marked the box first time guest on your connection card today, let me just say, we're so glad you're here. And in fact, we're gonna donate $5 on your behalf to our local food bank. $5 equates to 50 pounds of food for a family in need. And now I'm so excited to tell you guys that next week we're starting our brand new series entitled Twisted. Let's watch this video to learn more. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Twisted, the show where we reward the contestants who can best misuse scripture to mean whatever they want. <laughs> Let's meet our contestants. She's a no-nonsense mother of three who believes she knows everything about the Bible. Welcome, Helen! <laughs> Going up against her today is this confused man. Say hello to Doug! I'm not really sure why I'm here. It's time for our first challenge. Take any verse out of context. <laughs> Helen! John 14, 13, Jesus said, whatever you ask in his name, he will give to you. So if you don't get what you want, then that means that my faith is better than yours. Ah, uh, John 14, 13, just got Helen 14.13 points. <laughs> well, that brings us to our first break, but there'll be more twisted. Same time, same channel. <laughs> All right. Hey, we are very excited today. We're going to get to participate in someone taking the step of baptism. And so here's all you need to know. When they come up out of the water, I want you to scream your head off. All right. Can you do that? I know it's early, but you got an extra hour of sleep. All right. So I want to introduce you to Janice, and uh, she said, growing up in my family, we were not religious and really didn't attend church, but I was saved when I was around 13. I learned the basics of Christianity, but didn't always express it with the best decision. 
On December 11, 2012, I lost my grandfather to cancer. His death was unexpected and sudden. I was depressed, scared, and worried about my own life, working full-time, going to college full-time, encouraging my husband, who was also working and completing his degree, and being a parent to Mallory, who's now six. My life was beyond stressful, and things were falling apart. But I've accepted Christ into my heart and asked him to carry the load I can't manage. I've asked him to forgive my sins, help me better understand my purpose, follow his lead, and reduce my uncertainty and anxiety about things I cannot control. I feel compelled to take the next step in my growing faith through baptism. And so today, I want to let the world know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So Janice, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. We love doing this because that's an expression of people who have given their lives to follow Jesus. And you are a huge part of that. So I want to encourage you, since you've been found by God, to go out this week and find somebody else. Bring them with you next week because found people, people. have a wonderful week.